Hello and welcome. We are ready for our last time here together and our final lesson on our father's business. And I've titled this one an overview. This is a review of what we've done, but just kind of to wrap things up. And to start with, I just wanted to draw your attention to this picture here that I've been using as a cover picture. I thought it illustrated well um, just what we are to be about in the body of Christ, that, that we each are almost like a, a person playing an instrument in an orchestra or a band and that we are we are filled with the breath of God with the breath of the Holy Spirit as we um, minister and use our spiritual gifts in the body of Christ and that um, that this has really been a study of um, the a, a New Testament survey and this is why I have this little little boat here because it reminds me of of Jesus on the water and with his disciples and then we have um, this picture of the people playing in this orchestra as well as we relate the Old Testament of Isaiah 40 through 66 to um, the New Testament every book of the New Testament and understand our father's business so anyway, let's just go ahead and get started and open with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you and praise you so much um, just for your presence with us. Thank you for your faithfulness and bringing us through this study. Thank you that um, you do not leave us alone, but that you have come to us, that you have um, given us life. And um, thank you so much for hope in your name. And we pray as we go to your word again today that you would reveal yourself to us. God, that we would have hearts ready to receive. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so we started out this study with a, um, by way of introduction, we talked about Isaiah 39 and about Hezekiah. You remember that? Um, where um, Hezekiah's life really at the end of it um, was an illustration of the the state of the nation of Israel at the end of of the Old Testament and um, if you go back I encourage you to go back and listen to that introductory lesson again but um, remember we we talked about um, God coming um, in the midst of the darkness, the hope for humanity was our first lesson, hope for humanity. And we learned through this study that hope comes only through Jesus. And um, he breaks into that 400 years of silence and into the darkness and says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God, speak tenderly to Jerusalem. And um, what encouragement we find in those words from Isaiah 40 verses one and two. And then our father's business is really about how God breaks into our hopeless state by sending Jesus to take on human flesh and die for the sins of the world. And ultimately to remove the curse from all who believe. What encouragement in that. And, um, and Jesus, he is building a new habitat for the redeemed and a new creation, a new heavens and a new earth um, and the new Jerusalem. Um, and, and it will be a place that's free from the very presence of sin. And so our mission here while we're on this earth is to be ambassadors of Christ as though God were making his appeal through us to be reconciled to God because he's not willing that any should perish, but that all come to repentance. Um, and so we we see too that our father's business um, that some reject it that the sad fact is even given clear evidence um, that many choose to remain in sin and darkness and their hearts refuse to submit to God the treasure is right before them but they will not receive it remember our first lesson in Matthew um, from Isaiah 40 was that um, we have treasure beyond compare and that that it's right, Jesus says, here I am, I'm right here, I'm right before you. He offers us the gift of salvation, freely given, and yet some still refuse to accept it. They re refuse um, to receive it, and that is sad indeed. But um, we know that because we belong to Christ, our Father's business is our business. And again, God is not willing that any should perish, but all come to repentance. And so he calls us in Matthew 28 to go and make disciples, teaching them to obey all he has commanded us. Um, for he desires holiness of his people because he is holy. Um, and yet our lives, and this is kind of what motivated me to do this study, one of the reasons, and that is that my life is often filled with activity, and I have to stop and consider, you know, why am I doing what I'm doing? And, you know, our lives can easily just fast forward into this automatic action without realizing what is really driving our decisions. 
And um, what should our yeses be and what should our noes be? Um, do our pursuits chase after the values of the world or do they align with the agenda of Christ? And we, have we ever stopped to pray about our pursuits? And this was very convicting for me that I needed to be purposeful about those things that I was doing and that I was pursuing. And so um, we need to stop and consider why are we doing what we do? Um, and as we closed out last week, we, we talked about the, um, the church of Laodicea. And again, I want to bring us back to that. Um, it's just because I think that we are in that, that age right now that of those characteristics of that church apply to this generation today. Um, it says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. And then 1 Peter 2.25, You were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. And one thing that really stood out to me in the... the, um, the letters to these epistles that that, um, the apostles wrote in the New Testament was that that we need to submit to God as our ruler, as the overseer of our souls. And ultimately, as we reach um, the millennial age and the thousand year reign, all will be submitted to Christ as their Lord and master. And then in heaven, of course, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Um, And so, again, God doesn't want us to be on the fence. He doesn't want us to be lukewarm. He wants us to be purposeful in our deeds, purposeful, and um, to be drawing near to him and close to his heart and and not just um, dabbling in our Christianity, but being genuine, being authentic, being real, and truly being, spending our energies, our time, our resources into what his business is, his calling on our lives. Okay, and then we go on in that passage and it says, You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing, but you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. And so from this I get that we're not really called to live comfortably. But we are called to embrace the trials and difficulties before us because they build endurance. They, they produce that gold in our lives and they produce in us that which is pleasing to the Lord and those works that will last. And then we are also not called to activity just for activity's sake, but we are called to be faithful and obedient. We're called to faithfulness and to work out from our position in Christ that obedience. It comes sourced from him. And these are the white clothes, the white clothes of his righteousness in us, his work in us. And then we see that we're not called to follow the culture of the world, but we're to call, we're to focus on heaven's values um, so that we can see clearly. Um, and so this is um, a, a basis for, um, for what God is calling us to. And then finally, we get to Revelation 3.19 where it says, here I am. Again, Jesus says, I'm right before you. I am here. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. Remember, we talked about how that eating in every culture is related to fellowship and God desires fellowship and communion with his people. And yet we're so busy with our activities in our lives that we push him out to the outside and he has to knock to be let in. He's polite. He doesn't barge in on our lives. He waits to be invited. He waits to um, allow have us open our hearts to him. And Um, of all generations since the creation of the world, we are really the most accountable for we have the complete revealed word of God. We have the spirit of God dwelling within us and we have the witness of the fulfilled prophecies. And so this should cause us to both rejoice, but also to shudder, to realize the responsibility and the accountability that is ours. But Jesus is right before us. So how dare we push him to the outside of our lives? And in Psalm 81, it speaks about, you know, Jesus said, I would feed you with the finest of wheat, with honey from the rock, I would satisfy you. Um, And so he calls out to his people to come to him and to find our satisfaction in the Lord himself. 
Okay, and so, um, but we find in, back to Matthew again, uh, Matthew 6, 33, it says, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And as I thought about his kingdom and his righteousness, I thought, you know, the kingdom of heaven is a lot about our doing, and that is our participation and engagement with Christ in his business, but it's also about our being, who we are, that we are children of God. And then his righteousness has a lot to do with our being as well. That is our character and um, the faithfulness that he calls us to. But then um, it also has to do with our doing, and that is practicing his holiness in his in, in our lives. That is um, working out that salvation with fear and trembling. Um, and so the business of God really involves building the kingdom of God. That is the people brought to salvation, discipled in the faith, and participating in the local church. And, but the business of God also involves lives conformed to his image, that is, overcoming sin by yielding to the Spirit of God, building character by responding correctly to difficulties, and establishing faithfulness by obedience. And so it's not just our doing, but it's our being. It's who we are and who he's called us to be as well. Okay, and then we, we see also that um, ultimately, um, God has called us to, to live in such a way that is built upon his foundation and to live in such a way that is building upon that foundation before us. 1 Corinthians 3, 10 through 15 speaks of this. It says, But each one should be careful how he builds, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. And that is, salvation has already been established on the foundation of Christ, on his work alone. And so once we are saved, we, we participate in God's agenda of building his kingdom. And these are works done by the power of the Spirit of God within us. They are not works that seek to earn salvation and entrance into heaven because that is only based on the work of Christ. That foundation has been laid. The work of Christ is finished. It is complete. But then the verse goes on to say, If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. And so we see that for the believer, there is not a judgment of condemnation that is coming, but rather a a, um, a, a judgment based on rewards um, that of, of the works done by the power of Christ within us. And so this is what we seek to pursue are those things that are done by the power of Christ and in us and through us and those things that are indeed what our Father is about. And so again, 1 Corinthians 3.16, don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit lives in you? And again, it's by the Spirit of God, not by might nor by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord Almighty, Zechariah 4.6. Um, and then we learned in John, in John chapter 14, 12, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who has faith in me, that is Jesus, will do what I have been doing. He will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. And we might ask, how can we as believers do greater things than what Jesus did? And yet that comes about by the work of the Spirit of Christ in each one of us, that God multiplies his work on earth by working through every believer to accomplish his will. And so his business is in Indeed, our business. Um, and so as we read on in 1 Corinthians 3, 18 through 19, it says, Don't deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. And here again, we see that sometimes um, maybe um, what the world values or what the world considers um, what we should be about is probably not necessarily what God says that we should be about. And so we need to be be wise and um, not follow the pattern of the world, um, but be renewed in this pattern of thinking that's according to God's word and according to his wisdom, because the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. And the world will not always understand what we are doing um, because they are of the world and not of God. And yet we need to pursue those things that are of the Lord. 
um, 1 Corinthians 4, 1 through, 5, 1 through 5. So then men ought to regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. So God calls us to faithfulness. Um, we leave the results to God. The results really are not in our hands. They're not up to us. He just calls us to be faithful, to, um, to be about his business, and then leave the rest in the Lord's hand. And it says, It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. So we will be held accountable for what we've been given. And God calls us to use the gifts he's given us um, to, to um, build up the body of Christ and to um, evangelize the world, to encourage others. And so we will be held accountable for that. But God will bring to light the motives of our hearts. And yet we've been entrusted with this precious, precious treasure that is of the gospel of Christ. And what are we doing with that? And God calls us um, to simply be faithful to carry out his commands. And then 2 Corinthians 10, 12, you know, we might be tempted to compare, especially as women, we, we like to compare ourselves with other women. And maybe you, you see someone else doing all these things and have all this stuff on their plate. And you wonder, you know, how can she possibly do all that? And yet um, God doesn't call us to have um, the same calling as someone else or the specifics of that, that God doesn't call us to have um, everything on our plate all at once that he calls us to different seasons of life. Um, Psalm one talks about a tree bearing its fruit in its season. So there are seasons of rest, there's seasons of dormancy, and there are, um, seasons of, of building up and preparing for great fruitfulness. And so we cannot compare our lives um, with someone else's. Second Corinthians 10, 12 says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who are, who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. And so no one person can do everything. And this is why we are placed in a local church fellowship so that together with others, we can be a team, a single unit promoting the kingdom of God. And so it's important to know ourselves and what God has entrusted to us specifically so that we know our limits and don't try to copy what God has called someone else to do. And that's important in the body of Christ, that we make sure that we are um, walking closely with God so we can be discerning what he would have us um, be about. Okay, so our Father's business entails not only our doing and our being, but also our resting. God has designed us as rhythmic creatures in need of consistent rest. And, and um, as we've went, gone through this study, we've talked about this in great detail. And, and we see the example of Jesus, that while there was much work to do, Jesus, he pulled away from the crowd. He often spent time alone to pray. Um, Jesus didn't heal everyone. He didn't calm every storm. He didn't answer everyone's demands nor address every question. Jesus took time to eat, to sleep, to pray, and to rest. And Ecclesiastes 3.1 says, There is a time for everything and a season for every activity under heaven. So God calls us to live um, in communion with him, but in balance with our lives. And there's some reasons I've listed here, some reasons we refuse to rest and personally rest is actually a hard thing for me to do. I like to be doing, but, um, um, but rest, a, a lot of these reasons are sometimes why we don't rest. And that is we maybe are afraid to release control or we think everything depends on us. Um, or we assume we're above the need to rest, and yet Jesus himself modeled that in creation when he created the, the world in six days, and on the seventh day he rested. Do you think Jesus needed to rest? No, of course not. But he was giving us that model to follow because he knew that that's what we needed was rest as well. Um, sometimes we don't rest because we're seeking to please everybody around us, or we're seeking to earn favor with God and thinking we have to do all these things to gain his favor. Um, or we're overcommitted and have no time to rest. Um, or we're idolizing our work or we're seeking perfection in that work. It's never good enough. Or we're refusing to delegate. So there's a lot of reasons we refuse to rest. And yet God calls us. Part of his business is indeed resting. And that is an important part of his business. 
So our Father's business entails not only our doing and our being and our resting, but also God's glory. 1 Corinthians 10.31 says, So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And you might ask, well, what, what things bring glory to God? Well, there's all kinds of things. Um, I just listed a few here, but I'm sure that you can think of others. There's, you know, creativity brings glory to God. Um, hospitality brings glory to God. Our daily chores, those can bring glory to God. Faithfulness, of course, and loyalty, responsibility, provision, and nurturing, and building one another up, serving one another, all these things bring glory to God. They don't have to be, quote, spiritual things necessarily. They can just be the mundane things of life. These can bring glory to God as we um, submit to him and worship him um, in the midst of these things. Okay, so not only is our Father's business doing and being, resting and glorifying, but also knowing to know Christ, to draw near to Him. Philippians 3.10 says, I want to know Christ and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in His sufferings, becoming like Him in His death. And then Ephesians 3, 17 through 19. And I pray that you being rooted and established in love may have power together with all the saints to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. So our, our one of our big, um, big things in our lives is to be knowing God, getting to know him personally. Um, and so our business is to commune with God, to know him by his spirit through the word of God. That is how he reveals himself to us. Luke 10, 38, we have the example of Mary who sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to what he said. And um, you'll remember that, that Martha received a little rebuke during this time because, um, because she was um, fussy about all of her doing. And yet God was not asking Martha to squelch her gift, not at all. He was only asking her to keep things in the right order. Um, we cannot use our gifts to the neglect of communion with God. And we see later in another passage in John 12 that where they were meeting again. And it was um, it says, so they made him a supper there and Martha was serving. Again, she was serving and she was not rebuked for serving. That wasn't really the problem. Again, uh, we see that Martha was a great uh, woman of God. And in fact, in, in the middle of John's gospel, is it's actually um, a very climatic point um, when, when Jesus is raising Lazarus from the dead. And Martha makes a statement that I think is as powerful as Peter's statement when he says, you know, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And and um, Martha says, yes, Lord, she told him, I believe that you are the Christ, the Son of God, who was to come into the world. So Martha's confession is very powerful. And so Martha here is not um, any less spiritual than Mary. She just got off focus for a little bit here because Mary was sitting at the Lord's feet and learning of him. And Martha um, needed to make sure that she had things in the right order, that she couldn't neglect her communion with God for all her doing. And likewise for us, we need to make sure that we are being in close fellowship with God and not thinking that, that God desires our doing more than our being in his presence because he doesn't. He really desires that we will be in his presence and then the doing flows out of that. Okay, um, and Joshua 1, 8, it says, Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. So we are called to truly um, meditate on the word of God. Think about it all the time, to memorize it, to go over and over it and let it just permeate our lives. And Psalm 1, 2, and 3 says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. So there we have it again, the, the crucial importance of being in the word and drawing near to the Lord in that way. And then we see from Psalm 127, 1, that unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. So even our doing is really for nothing. All the activity is really for nothing if God is not in it. Um, and so God has to be present. His presence needs to permeate every part of it. 
Um, and by contrast, little is much if God is in it. I'm sure you've heard that little phrase. And so prayer is critical because we're dependent on the Lord. We need to be going to him in prayer um, to seek his face and to be seeking his presence in, in all that we do. Matthew 28, 19, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So it's important that we seek the Lord and that we are pursuing his pursuits and his presence within those pursuits. Um, okay, so to, to wrap this up, after we've been studying the New Testament in this manner, it's really given us a bird's eye view of what our God is about. And by relating it to Isaiah 40 through 66, we've seen some clear evidence, I believe, that this was God's agenda from the beginning. Um, and we've also learned that the reason believers remain on earth is not only to glorify God and draw close to him in relationship, but to be his ambassadors, to carry out his mission, to be about his agenda. So in summary then, what does this entail? And so I've listed a few things here, and this, these are, this is not all inclusive, okay, but these are just some things that as I was reviewing all of our lessons that we've gone over that, that stood out to me. First of all, exalting his worthy name, submitting to Christ as Lord over all, treasuring the kingdom of heaven, and knowing Christ and making him known. And you could just summarize it all right there in that, in those four statements. But there's much... Um, much in, entails the home and much entails the church, really. The church is a big part of God's business. And I want us to take a look at some of those things under the church. We have participation in a local church fellowship where the word of God is proclaimed, the preaching and teaching of the word, submitting to one another, promoting unity, equipping and encouraging believers, being empowered by the Holy Spirit to practice our spiritual gifts. And those gifts are to be practiced within the church to benefit um, the church body. And likewise, if we're not engaged in a, in a church fellowship, we can't benefit from the gifts of others. And so it's mutual. We need, we need both. Um, uh, we need the gifts of others, and they need our gifts to minister to them as well. Um, and then there's evangelizing the world with the gospel. Of course, that is big. Maintaining the purity of the church in doctrines and in lifestyles. Loving others by doing what's best for them. Upholding truth, confronting error. Protecting the church and the home from false teachers. And then in the home, we have, you know, maintaining the family unit and household code. This is a testimony to the mission of Christ and to a picture of our relationship with him. So it's very important. Uh, raising a godly generation of children and training them in the faith. Conforming our character to the image of Christ and worshiping God together. Um, saturating our families with the word of God. And so this is really what entails our father's business. And like I said, there, there's, this isn't an all-inclusive list. There's more, I'm sure. So, But these are some of the main things. Um, and so something that has stood out to me after doing this study is that, that Christ really does love the church. He gave himself for her. And so do we love the church? Do we love the people of God? Should we not do the same? Should we not give our lives for each other? We are called to submit to church leadership, to exercise our gifts in a church fellowship, to be accountable to a local church. Um, there's no accountability if we are not involved in close relationships in a local church, and that's important. Um, we're called to worship together in a church body. We're called to love what Christ loves and hate what he hates. Um, we are his ambassadors to a lost world, and we're here on earth for a purpose. So let's not forsake the meeting of ourselves together, but rather work as one team toward our common goal, and that is to proclaim his salvation to the ends of the earth. And so, finally, delight in knowing Christ. We know him through the word of God, by the spirit of God. But I challenge you to take it a step further and to know him in your own personal experience. This comes as we apply the word in obedience by faith. Challenge yourself to move into the calling of God. See if he will not show himself strong on your behalf. And just by way of testimony to wrap this up, I just want to say how this study was even born to start with, that it came out of my own personal quiet time with the Lord. For me personally, I read through um, the Old Testament and the New Testament at the same time. I pick one chapter um, from the Old. I go through the, the whole thing in, in its order and a chapter in the New. And so I end up reading the, the New Testament 
twice as many times as the Old Testament with that system. But as I was going through and just studying the Word of God, when I got to Isaiah, it just, it really struck me how similar these chapters were to um, the message of the New Testament. And I just thought, you know, this would be a great study to do. And then God took that, that, um, that vision, that desire, and um, develop that. And it's just been such a joy to be here with you and go through the study with you. Um, so thank you for being here and motivating me to, um, to study hard and, and, to, and to bring us through and, and to this point. But I just tell you that because I want to encourage you to be in the Word of God, to really study the Word of God, because nothing is more rewarding than drawing near to God in His Word and to, and to face a challenge and watch as God shows up and shows off, as God shows himself strong on our behalf and what a blessing it is to be participators in that and so god calls us to keep on asking keep on seeking keep on knocking and he will answer you know as we delight ourselves in communion with jesus he aligns our heart with his will and when that happens it unleashes all the yes and amen of christ to push forward into that which is our father's business Um, So thank you so much for being here, and it's been, like I say, a joy, and um, this is the end of our study, but I encourage you to continue on in the Word of God on your own and just really get to know the Lord in that way. So thank you for being here.